Right, so hello everyone and welcome to the third in our lockdown series of webinars. This one's an exciting one um, about open orienteering map, which I know is a topic that a lot of you really um, have been getting to grips with and there's lots of questions and queries. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Ollie O'Brien, who's the creator of the tool, who's going to take us through it. Um, for those of you that haven't um, been part of the previous two we've run or any of the previous British orienteering ones, we did one in the last few weeks on Root Gadget and Map Run, and those are all available to view from the British Engineering website. Um, but for now, there is on the dashboard, you'll see a little function that says questions, and that's where you can type your questions. So at any point whilst Ollie's going through his presentation, if you want anything clarified or there's anything you don't quite understand, or if there's a question and answer that you want Ollie to talk about at the end when we do the little question and answer session, and if you type those questions in there, then I'll be able to see those and hopefully we'll answer those as we go along. Um, if not, there'll be an opportunity at the end. And failing that, we'll make sure that all questions are asked um, are answered by Ollie, obviously subsequently dependent on how long we go. So I will hand you over to Ollie and hope everyone enjoys the session on Open Orienteering Map. Thank you, Natalie. Um, uh, and first of all, apologies, uh, um, people won't be seeing me because due to a slight software bug, uh, my webcam is not is not uh, working with the application. However, uh, my slides should be working fine. Um, okay, so I'm going to be talking for the next probably around 20 minutes or so, basically just giving an introduction to Open Orienteering Map, um, but also I'm going to um, give an introduction to basic editing and open street map, which is a key function of um, how maps are produced with Open Orienteering Map. Um, and then uh, after those um, slides, I'm going to do a demonstration of, again, um, creating a map of open orienteering map and also doing editing of open street map. Uh, and then finally, we'll open up to a Q&A. But as Natalie says, um, uh, if, if um, uh, you have questions as, as the um, presentation goes along, feel free to type them in um, and Natalie will curate and, and, and pass um, those over to me. Okay. So um, this is what I'm going to run through over the next um, 20 minutes or so. Um, I'm basically going to talk about what um, Open Orienteering Map is, but also importantly, what it is not. Um, uh, talk quickly about um, how it came into being. Um, discuss the um, various different versions or editions of um, Open Orienteering Map that are available. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about some of the orienteering specific features um, on Open Orienteering Map. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about imports, um, how you get maps and data, uh, mapping data into um, Open Orienteering Map, and finally, how you take um, uh, Open Orienteering Map that you've created and uh, either create a printed map or export it to several other applications. Um, as I mentioned, I'm then going to do a special section about how you do basic edits of OpenStreetMap in order to add background mapping data um, to uh, Open Orienteering Map. Um, so I'm going to do two demos, creating a map, um, and also one of the editors on OpenStreetMap. And then finally, we'll have a, a more formal Q&A. So um, what Open Orienteering Map is, it is a website. Um, it's a quick and easy way to create um, an orienteering map, but these are not quote, real orienteering maps. These are orienteering maps which um, are generally used for streetos. Um, and let's say I've got a list here of the sorts of functions um, that these maps are typically used for. Um, but of course, it's a tool, um, so people can use a tool um, however they like. But generally, these are often used for um, informal evening club events. Um, of course, it's not happening at the moment, um, but traditionally, my, my own club, and I know several other clubs in the UK and elsewhere, have used um, open orienteering maps to produce um, uh, maps for club events. Uh, they're good for training events. Um, they seem to be great for lockdown though, where you are, may, you may be locked down at home or in your local area, but you essentially want to create an orienteering map of that local area, uh, and you're not lucky enough to live on a proper orienteering map. Um, uh, they are intended for foot o score events, although people can adapt it to other event types, such as MTBO or uh, linear or regular orienteering. Um, open orienteering map is mainly based on open street map data. Um, which is uh, quite different to the uh, sorts of mapping data that we, we use to create our professional orienteering maps that we, we know. Um, it is worldwide, um, but uh, as is the nature of OpenStreetMap, some areas are mapped better than other areas. Um, and also, I myself update the data for Open, open Orienteering Map uh, with different schedules as well. So for the UK, and I know most of the audience will be UK-based here, we do have daily updates. I'm going to go into detail about that um, in a later slide. Another key thing is um, Open Orienteering Map is free. 
and it's open source. Uh, I haven't promoted the uh, location of the source code particularly well yet, um, but essentially um, I'll, I'll post a link to the GitHub repository for open orienting map at the end of this um, slideshow. But it's important to say what um, uh, open orienting map is not. It is not a standalone software application. It is just a website. It is also not the mapper product um, from the open orienteering project. So you may hear open orienteering map and open orienteering mapper. They do sound rather similar, um, but they are completely different. Um, open orienteering projects mapper is essentially a free and open source version of the OCAD software. Um, although it's, uh, it, it's, it's perhaps more similar to older versions of, of OCAD. Um, Open Orientary Map is not for production of ISOM or ISSOM standard maps, as I say. I have borrowed some of the colors and styling from those, um, those mapping standards, uh, so the maps at least look vaguely similar to proper orienteering maps. But for instance, one of my big changes is uh, for the basic Streeto style, white means out of bounds, houses and gardens, and not forest. Um, it's not high accuracy map, it's not high detail mapping, it is very dependent on the quality of how the local over and street mappers, who may or may not be orienteers, have contributed to it. Um, the other thing is um, for the uh, uh, real mapping nerds amongst us, um, uh, open orienteering map doesn't produce maps aligned to magnetic north, which is how um, uh, how regular orienteering maps uh, are, uh, and actually not uh, not aligned to on a server grid north either. Um, it's actually aligned to GPS north, um, so if you are um, out with an open orienteering map and a GPS, um, then the north that your um, your smartphone or other GPS device will correspond exactly to the north where you see an open orienteering map. Now these days, of course, in practice, magnetic north and true north are almost the same, uh, but that's certainly not the case historically. Um, open orienteering map started as an MSC project way back in 2008. Um, it, the project was called using a GIS to create street orienteering maps. Now um, it was essentially, the problem was we, we had street orienteering maps every month in my club, slow, um, but these maps were hard and difficult to produce and tricky to update. Um, and they were done in a very sort of manual way by tracing A to Z maps uh, using MS Paint or even PowerPoint, funny enough. Uh, and that was a that was quite a slow and painful way to create street o maps, although plenty of street o maps were still being created. But I was, I was keen for new mappers uh, and other areas of London, South London, uh, to become street o areas. Now, um, as I say, I produced a, a workflow using a GIS, but GIS software is and was and very much still is quite um, quite a hard um, a software um, type to use. Um, although again, it's, it's coming along. Um, there is another project called walking streets on OpenStreetMap, which created PDFs of simple maps to allow people to annotate and add data back into OpenStreetMap. So essentially what I did is I took both, ide both ideas together, along with a work project which created dynamically generated maps of the UK censuses, and I launched uh, OpenOrientereMap back in 2010. So bear in mind, this is quite an old website, um, and that is reflected in the GUI. Um, it is rather clunky, um, as I say in my slide here, because it's so old, and it's basically been adapted and extended as people have started to use it for uh, diff various different um, uh, types of maps. Um, so the UI is, is perhaps due a refresh, but hopefully it is usable um, uh, for its current purposes of, of creating lockdown type maps. Uh, and as I say, um, one point there, first it was the UK and then quite quickly the whole world. Um, so there's several editions. The UK edition is updated every morning from the latest OpenStreetMap. So if you edit OpenStreetMap um, the day before, then it will appear in op uh, Open Orienting Map the following day. Uh, it also has 10 meter contours from OS Open Data, except for Northern Ireland, I'm afraid. Um, I know 10 meter contours are not great resolution of contours. We're used to five meters or even two and a half meters on our regular orienteering maps in the UK, um, but it was a free and open data set. And there is a five meter version of um, corner survey data, but it's unfortunately not open data, and so not free. Um, I should give a hat tip to our host, British Orienteering, who did fund um, um, hosting of the website, but also some improvements between 2012 and 2014, I think, I may be wrong with those dates, but also the Orienteering Foot Foundation, who again uh, funded some updates and hosting in 2016 uh, uh, to um, the map, and I'm very, very grateful to those um, uh, financial contributions to the project. Um, I did used to do updates every minute from OpenStreetMap, but that really needs a very powerful server because there are an awful lot of OpenStreetMap edits happening in the UK, and so um, I had discontinued that. Um, uh, so I instead do this daily um, clear and rebuild, and generally that works much better and it works uh, 
uh, it's more smooth. The, the number of times that the feed fails is much less now, but it only works once a day. Um, there is also an, a, an Ireland edition, which uses the same database as the UK, but like Northern Ireland has no consoles. Uh, the Denmark edition has daily updates, um, but again, no consoles. Uh, and the Australia edition is brand new. It only launched last week. Um, and Streeto has been massive in Australia. And actually, the Streeto community in Australia contributed to my a master's project back in 2010 so it's quite nice to wondering why why there aren't contours for other countries yes that's a great question um uh, it's because there was a very easy way um to get the contours in for the uk uh, as a basically able to just get it from us open data um there isn't really a global open data set of contours there are there is a global dem called srtm but turning that into contours that don't look really jagged and ugly is pretty involved. Um, there are some people who have done that project, but not made it as um, free. So I am hoping to get contours in for Australia because I'm saying I'm working with um, uh, some of the uh, uh, organizers of the Street series in Melbourne and Australia, um, and hopefully uh, we'll get contours in for Australia, but it is probably gonna be on a country by country basis um, rather than yeah. just having a global contour data set. Yeah, so they can always get in touch afterwards if they want to uh, have specific requests. But another quick question was just that um, Ian's asked about when he's gone in and updated OpenStreetMap um, and then other non-orienteers have gone in and deleted any changes, um, assuming there's no protection against this because it's open access. So if someone deletes your changes that you yes, may have made. Yes, no, that is, that is a, a problem uh, for sure. Um, it's, I mean, OpenStreetMap is not, it doesn't quite suffer from vandalism in, to the extent that Wikipedia does, even though you could say, and I will introduce OpenStream as being the wiki of, of, of world maps, um, but it is an issue to be aware. But in practice, you'd be very unlucky if somebody maliciously interferes with an area that you are um, uh, creating an orienteering map of. What's more likely to happen is somebody does an innocent change, which does affect um, how um, the orienteering map is produced. Um, it is therefore very much a case of of produce your orienteering map as close as possible to your event um, and you know maybe a maximum two or three days before the event because otherwise there is a risk and actually do I do touch on this a bit later on there is a risk if you if you make a change um, I don't actually store what the orienteering map bit looks like on my server so when you come to produce your map a few days after you've um, done, done the edit you may find actually somebody else has done some further editing as well and so it's changed again so yes that's a, that's a great question um, so just touching on the global edition of um, uh, OpenStreetMap, uh, the global OpenStreetMap database is absolutely huge. As anybody who's, who's dealt with it will, will know, it's, it's many, many terabytes. Um, sorry, it's many, it's many hundreds of gigabytes. Um, so you know, you need a sort of a terabyte of space to deal with it. Um, so in practice, I only update it once a year or so because it takes a good two or three weeks to rebuild the database. Um, so generally what I'm doing is I'm adding countries when I get you know good requests coming from those countries and, and people are likely to use a map in those countries. They're likely to update OpenStreetMap as one of the key um, benefits for me of, of, of having orienteers, you know, editing OpenStreetMap, is it, it makes the map better for everyone. Um, there is an edition called Blueprint, um, which is black and white outline maps, a little bit like Blueprint. They're not really intended for orienteering. They're sort of intended for coloring maps. Um, there's sort of this phase of coloring in blank, or not blank, uh, black and white maps a, few, uh, a couple of years ago, um, Vion and Sergio themselves produced um, a big uh, book of maps to colour in and so forth. Well, let's do that with OpenStreetMap as well. Anyway, so that is um, one of the other options in OpenOrientureMap. Okay. Um, so uh, in OpenOrientureMap itself, there's three map styles. There's Streeto, which is faithful to the style that we used for the Slow Street series many years ago. And there's a no rail version, which just takes out railway features. Of course, you can't run on the railway lines, um, but they are often useful navigationally. But in certain parts of London, there's so many railway lines that it actually makes looking at the underlying map quite hard. And then finally, there's this slightly more perhaps controversial style called Pseudo, um, which borrows colors and styles uh, from ISOM, um, but ultimately it's not producing ISO map, but it is producing a map which might look a little bit more like a regular orienteering map. One constraint for um, open orienteering map is the start and finish is always the same place. Controls are added manually or via imports, and I'll, I'll touch on imports in detail in a moment. Um, you can also add two other orienteering specific features which don't make sense uh, to be added uh, into OpenStreetMap itself. Um, I'm very keen for 
as many details to be added in OpenStreetMap as possible, um, but it doesn't make sense to add these two particular kinds of features in um, OpenStreetMap because they are very much for orienteering in particular. Um, one is crossing points, uh, which is uh, for emphasizing where to cross busy roads. Um, if uh, an event organizer is worried that um, a road may be too busy for people to run across, they make a mark in crossing points. Uh, and also it may be useful to emphasize um, uh, you know, for instance, where to cross a high fence if you are in a, in a say, a park. Uh, the other special orienteering feature, um, which exists only on Open Orienteering Map and not Open Street Map, is do not cross crosses. Um, uh, this arose because um, I don't map gates from Open Street Map on Open Orienteering Map because access details are often incorrect, um, and it's often it's very hard to say, okay, let's map all gates as where people can't pass if it's set for pedestrian access equals no, because that is often not the case um, for maps on the ground, at least in London. So this is basically a ma ability for people to manually add a, a red crosses to, in to to highlight the fact that this road is, is is blocked, and you could use it in locked paths as well, parks as well to indicate um, the paths in these parks are not accessible. Okay. Um, so importing in for controls. Now, generally, uh, people when they're creating an, an, a map in Open Orienteering Map, is they will manually add the control sites in that they're interested in. But um, there are there are um, some ways to automatically add controls in. Maybe you just want to sort of you very quickly want to create a map of your local area for lockdown orienteering, um, or you want to just have some inspiration and you're maybe not sure of of, of potential control sites in. Um, an area that you're mapping um, before you want to go out and find your own. Um, so these are currently post boxes um, for the UK and this this imports from a project called the Dracos project um, and the reason why it's important for that project is it separates out the post box codes and often for um, slow streetos and other streetos in London is one of the ways that people prove they've been to the control is um, they write in the code. So post boxes in the UK have codes on them. It's the first part of the postcode followed by a number. And often we, we say if you write in a number, that proves that you are there. Um, so by getting that information in to the uh, Open Orienteering map, that allows an organizer to create an answer list effectively, um, uh, uh, or, or rather note down the codes rather than having to go out and actually visit um, the post boxes themselves. Um, so in a similar vein, uh, the blue, blue plaques from the Open Plaques project, it's not just blue plaques these days, it's plaques of all, all shapes and colours. Um, again, that's mainly UK, but um, that project is spreading beyond the UK, so you will find um, if you are, for instance, uh, creating an open orientering map in Germany, that uh, some German cities will have many plaques that are pulled into the importer. I do also have two um, extra kinds of imports controls planned for open orientering map. One is permanent orientering course posts. This will import directly from OpenStreetMap. Um, this will use a different mechanism to the background map uh, and therefore it means that if you add a permanent orienteering post into OpenStreetMap it will immediately appear in Open Orienteering Map when you press the importer. And I'm planning on doing the same thing for other points of interest such as monuments or fountains. Um, all of these imports, and I do mean all of these, are editable by everybody at source. Um, so you can edit the Trackos Post Boxes project, you can edit blue plaques, uh, you can edit um, OpenStreetMap to add in permanent orienteering course posts and points of interest, and those edits can, can come into Open Orienteering Map. That's what question I was going to ask, Wally. So people can remove post boxes if they don't exist anymore or they're not there anymore. Um, they, now that you said that, I'm not 100% sure the Trackos project does let you do that. I think it does. Um, and actually, somebody did request recently: Would it be possible to import post boxes from OpenStreetMap rather than Dracos? Because yes, that's really editable. Um, the problem is in OpenStreetMap, generally the reference numbers are not available, whereas they are in the Dracos project. Um, I I would have to check the website itself, um, or, or if people are interested to check the Dracos website to see if they can remove it. Um, you can certainly add in detail, or rather, I think what Dracos did is he he got a file from a post office of all post boxes in the UK, and he then created a tool which allows people to add in the reference numbers to those post boxes. Now, whether that tool allows the post boxes to be deleted, or not, I'm not sure. But that's a good so question. So there you go, Andy. Get yourself onto onto the and then see that way. Thanks, Ollie. Uh, okay, so let's come to the next slide. Um, okay, so exports. Um, now, the traditional way of exporting from Open Orienteering Map is to uh, print the map directly. Now, I've always been keen for the orienteering maps to look good, even if they are 
um, low quality in terms of the precision or the detail of the feature shown on it. I want the map itself to look as good as the professionally printed orienteering maps that we, we know and love from the, from the sport. So I've always been keen that the PDFs produced from uh, that, it's PDFs that people mainly use to print rather than JPEGs or PNGs. Uh, and that those PDFs are so-called vector PDFs, so they'll print very, very nicely. The only bit maps um, in uh, the PDFs produced by Open Orienteering Maps are the little logo for the Open Orienteering Foundation on the top right as an acknowledgement of my last big sponsor, uh, and aerial textures such as undergrowth lines just because of technical issues with turning that into an SVG. Um, also, you can print clue sheets if you're doing a score race. Uh, at the moment, these clue sheets do contain the answers as well as the questions for your, um, uh, if you're using a post box importer. So organizers should bear that in mind if you're doing a competitive race, you want to, you want to delete the, the bits of those codes. But I do plan to separate those out um, soon, hopefully. Um, now, and this is where the seminar um, arose from, but I know Open Orienteering Map is, can be used um, to import into Root Gadget 2, and that is done using a low resolution 72 dpi JPEG and a JGW file. Now, the JGW file um, is used by Root Gadget to geolocate the JPEG in Root Gadget, in other words, to um, relate it to other underlying maps. Um, the only thing I need to say is um, I use the so-called Web Mercator projection, um, which is generally referred to by those codes EPSG3857 or EPSG900913, which if you squinted it hard, sort of reads like the word Google, that's deliberate. Um, those are the two files that you need to download from um, Open Orange Map in order to get into Root Gadget. To get access to the JPEGs and the JGW files, you need to save as a PDF. That will download your, your PDF, but it will then also make available those buttons uh, for loading. Um, the other uh, key export, and one that has been added very recently, and this is, um, has been added specifically as a response to the increased people, increased usage of Open Orienteering Map over the last few weeks of lockdown, um, is an import into MapRun F. Um, MapRun F is uh, one of many apps which um, essentially allow you to run an orienteering course on your smartphone, but MapRun F does seem to have gained significant traction. Again, it's very popular in Australia, and it's become very popular here in the UK as well, particularly in the last few weeks. Um, so it made sense for me to make the process of exporting your map from Open Orienteering Map into MapRun F as painless as possible. And so there are now two buttons to do that. Um, there's a KML button, which will give you a, um, a uh, file just containing where your controls are, and that's a data file, um, because MapRun F needs to know uh, where, where your controls and start and finish are. Uh, and then a KMZ file. Now the KMZ file contains a high resolution JPEG and also geolocation information. That JPEG contains the crossing points and the do not cross markers, but it does not contain the controls and it does not contain the start and finish. And that's deliberate because it's acting as a background map and the control circles will get added by MapRun F um, uh, uh, application itself. Uh, you can also import uh, into Google Earth. Google Earth happily takes in the KMZs and the KMLs as well, although you won't get the um, control um, circle styling if you import the KML in that way. And as I just say at the bottom, do know that although the sheet, that is the area of the map you're interested in, um, its, um, its scale, the controls and the overprint features are saved in my database, the background map is not saved. And so every time you load your map in from open or interior map, it will reconstruct um, the background open orienteering map map um, based on the most recent load of OpenStreetMap. So do bear that in mind if you create a map a week before your event and then you come to print your map two days before the event. If you're really unlucky, somebody will have made a change to OpenStreetMap, which has deleted an important um, road or uh, path which, which will hinder your event. Now, it's unlikely to happen. I mean, generally, it's rare to get a malicious vandalism in OpenStreetMap, at least in non-controversial parts of the world or non-disputed parts of the world. Um, and therefore, unless that path really is, you know, closed due to construction works or a road has been closed, then this is a, a somewhat theoretical issue. But it's something to bear in mind when you're using this for a, for a regular event. Okay, right, I'm going to just checking the time. So I've been going for 20 minutes now. So I'm going to um, talk about editing OpenStreetMap. Um, as I say, I'm going to give a demo. So although there are quite a lot of points here and it's quite wordy, I will run through these when actually doing the demo as well. Um, so OpenStreetMap is a database, not a map. Um, although most people know a map created from OpenStreetMap at OpenStreetMap.org. Um, some people would say it's a Wikipedia of spatial data. 
there are many, many maps created from OpenStreetMap these days, including Open or Engineering Map, but also Strava. Strava switched from Google Maps because Google Maps um, charged a super sky. Uh, super sky high fees now for using their maps uh, for large organizations uh, and Mapbox and of course Mapbox itself is used by many other websites including BBC I think. Um, far more maps than you realize are created from OpenStreetMap so a lot of people care about the mapping data in OpenStreetMap. This is both um, good for us because it means an awful lot of people rather than just orienteers are creating the base map but bad because of course one of the things you've got to bear in mind is OpenStreetMap is not an orienteering map. One of my goals when creating Open Orienteering Map um, was to uh, get orienteers editing OpenStreetMap more. And certainly it seems I've got quite a few people uh, doing that from the orienteering community, which is great. But do remember it is a general purpose database and not an orienteering map. Uh, and do be especially mindful of deleting or modifying somebody else's work. We had an issue um, a few months ago where uh, one particular region had an excessive amount of fences added. Um, somebody deleted all those fences because it was cluttering up the orienteering map. Um, problem was, the map was very cluttered for sure, but the fences were actually there on the ground. It was just that particular area had been mapped to, to you know, an almost obsessive detail. So do be very mindful and don't, don't delete somebody else's work unless it really doesn't exist on the ground. That's one of the general rules. Um, map what you see on the ground, not don't try and map for the renderer or tag for renderer. In other words, don't don't change a map so that it looks different in OpenStreetMap unless you are still reflecting what is actually on the ground. And the general way to edit OpenStreetMap is to use the built-in editor on the website. Um, advanced users can use other tools, but that is definitely beyond the scope of this um, talk. OpenStreetMap doesn't have a fixed feature list, unlike our orienteering map. So our proper orienteering maps use ISSOM or ISOM or other standards. OpenStreetMap doesn't have a standard and that's deliberate and it can be quite frustrating. But one of the key things is if you follow the um, conventions, which are documented in the OpenStreetMap wiki, then your work will appear on other people's maps. If you don't, you'll find that your, your mapping data just doesn't appear on anybody else's maps. So there's a sort of implicit um, push um, towards um, people following the convention. But there's nothing to stop people from creating new conventions and actually permanent orienteering courses, which I'll touch on in a moment, are one of those conventions. Um, as I say here, OpenStreetMap has good high quality resolution, aerial imagery from Microsoft, Bing. It actually has even better resolution, I discovered this evening, from two other projects, um, including somehow premium uh, aerial imagery uh, is able to be used to trace new features for OpenStreetMap. And once those features are traced for OpenStreetMap, of course, they can then be used uh, for uh, orienteering maps. Um, but do bear in mind that um, Microsoft Bing aerial imagery and perhaps the others can be 10 to 20 meters off the correct location. This is particularly a problem for aerial imagery, which is um, taken from planes flying overhead rather than satellites. Um, you tend to have perspective issues. Uh, they're essentially taking a photograph which is not necessarily directly downwards uh, and turning it into a photograph which is directly downwards. This can cause buildings to appear at funny angles and you have to be very careful if you're tracing something that is not at ground level. Um, don't use copyright and non-open sources. Um, don't use proper orienteering maps to create uh, data in OpenStreetMap because your proper orienteering map is probably using, in the UK, on a survey non-open copyright. Now that's covered by the British Orienteering Agreement and they are due to VOS for that, um, but it's, it can't be used for projects like OpenStreetMap. Don't trace on Google Maps either. Um, I have said here, the old glance at Google Street View or an orienteering map is okay uh, to maybe suggest where you need to go on the ground to verify, or maybe just to jog your memory of, of, of a previous wonder. That's probably okay, but don't actually directly derive your data from OS um, non-open copyright maps, such as orienteering maps, regular orienteering maps, or Google Maps. Um, advanced users can also uh, trace or even directly import OS open data. Um, again, that's beyond the scope of this. If you, if you know how to do this, then I don't need to tell you how it works. Um, don't do bulk imports. Again, you're unlikely to be doing bulk imports uh, unless uh, you are an advanced OpenStreetMap user, but bulk imports, even if they are for the benefit of creating better orienteering maps, could potentially affect somebody else's uh, hard work manual effort on, in a particular area. So generally, don't try not to do them. Best way is to just go out there and, and walk your area. Annotate a printout map and upload it or use a smartphone app. Um, there's an app called Vespucci, which seems to be the most popular um, smartphone app for editing OpenStreetMap. I haven't used it myself. I use a, a program called OSM Hand and edit while you walk. 
um, if you want. You can also record a GPS trace, such as on a Garmin GPS, you know, the ones that we, we all, all wear, or many of us wear when we go on our regular engineering races. Uh, you can upload that to, um, say, Strava, export that as a GPS, a GPX file, upload a GPX file to OpenStreetMap and then trace it. That sounds a bit long-winded, um, but it's what I used and been using the last few days to add in some permanent orienteering course maps. And it's actually straightforward once you've done it a few times. Okay, um, okay, so I need to talk a little bit about how OpenStreetMap links to Open Orienteering Map. When you edit OpenStreetMap, there is a delay before it appears on Open Orienteering Map. That delay is typically 12 to 36 hours. If you get your edits in before around 8 p.m., then they should appear in, in OpenStreetMap, then they should appear in Open Orienteering Map by 8 a.m. the following morning. If you edit at, say, 9 p.m., you're going to have to wait to the day after. For Australia, the timelines are slightly longer due to time zones and because I generally want my database rebuilds to happen at night. And as I say, for global, you're, you're more talking about a year. Um, so if you're editing OpenStreetMap uh, in a country which is not covered by one of the daily country uh, editions of Open Orienteering Map, then unfortunately you're not necessarily going to see that work go into Open Orienteering Map immediately. I use a daily um, database slice, which is generated by a third party called Geofabric and built in the early morning. Um, one thing to say is edits to important imported features, that's the ones that appear as controls rather than map features that have no delay. You edit at the source and they'll appear immediately for import. Currently, there isn't that function. Open Street, there is no way to import data from OpenStreetMap as controls, but I am going to put that functionality in very soon. Okay, now, um, uh, I'm just checking the time. It's been going for just under half an hour. So the final bit of this talk, uh, almost final bit of this talk, is on um, uh, permanent orienteering uh, courses and how we could put these into OpenStreetMap. This is a sort of big idea I've had for the last few days when I basically discovered uh, a old um, private permanent orienteering course essentially by my house. I've been living here for eight years and only just realized <laughs> I've been living on an orienteering map. Um, currently, there are only 500 permanent orienteering course markers on OpenStreetMap, which is maybe about 20 courses. And I know for a fact there's more than 20 permanent orienteering courses in the world, and definitely more than 20 even just in the UK. Let's get them into OpenStreetMap. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll build an importer into Open Orienteering Map. So one click, you'll be able to pull the locations and um, names and codes of the uh, uh, permanent orienteering course markers into Open Orienteering Map. Now, obviously, Open Orienteering Map is mainly used in urban areas, and permanent orienteering course markers are likely to mainly be in rural areas, but it still gives us you know, additional uh, data sources um, for importing to OpenStreetMap. I've got a proposed tag list here. Um, essentially, there's five tags. Um, you, you don't need to remember these right now if you're interested in this project, because I have documented it on the OpenStreetMap wiki. So if you basically just search for OpenStreetMap orienteering wiki, then you'll find these tags. Um, they are very similar to the tags that were there before, but I've slightly tweaked them to reflect how I think uh, permanent orienteering course markers should be tagged. Basically, it's five tags, sport equals orienteering, orienteering equals marker, and then marker equals post if it's on a post that is there for the reason of being a permanent orienteering course marker, or marker equals plate if it's attached to something else. So often permanent orienteering course markers are attached to benches, they may be attached to fences or buildings. Uh, you can also use marker equals ground, um, I, when I was just looking for OpenStreetMap last night, I found one marker that is bolted onto the ground, which is quite quite an evil marker for somebody to find. Uh, and also marker equals pole if necessary. You can also put in ref equals five or whatever, um, and answer equals CQ. So that is the actual information on the on the, the plate or on the orienteering marker. You don't have to do this. Um, people can go out and find it themselves, um, but it means that we can pull that data into Open Orienteering Map and allow people to use these permanent orienteering markers and people to be able to prove that we're there without actually needing the original um, permanent orienteering course map. I should say, when you do this, this won't appear in the main OpenStreetMap map unless you use Barry equals Bollard, but that's a bit naughty because um, although your average uh, permanent orienteering course post looks like a bollard. It's not actually blocking anybody from getting anywhere. Uh, they also won't appear in the regular open orienteering map as ground features unless they're on a bench and the bench will appear on fence. But uh, like I say, I am planning on putting an importer into open orienteering map. If you are a pro OSM user, 
then you can create what's known as a relation, which is basically something that links multiple features together. Uh, you can create a relation which links all controls in a, in a permanent Unitarian course, or even create a relation for each course. However, I'm not planning on pulling those in at this time. But if you are a pro OSM user who's also an orienteer, and you're quite keen to get your POC properly mapped on OpenStreetMap, then yeah, you know, have a look at how relations work. Okay, now uh, do excuse me for this fairly complicated looking um, diagram here, but this is a sort of graphical um, summary of, of the last few slides. Essentially, it shows all the data sources that come into Open Orienteering Map and all the file formats uh, and uh, uh, applications that you can export from Open Orienteering Map. Now, the key thing and the key thing about this is so the top row is external data coming in. Uh, the box is the website, and then at the bottom is the file formats and the external applications. Now, the key thing here is blue boxes are boxes for places where you can do the editing. So when you are creating an open orienteering map, map you can edit OpenStreetMap, you can edit open plaques, and I think you can edit Dracos post, post boxes. Uh, you can also put in custom controls on open orienteering map itself and over printed features. Um, and the other thing is dotted, uh, dashed lines are not currently there, but these are things I'm planning on putting in in the next few weeks, um, uh, including one feature which will allow those do not cross crosses and crossing points to be persisted. So when an organizer comes three years later and creates a street over the same area, they always discover the recommended crossing points and blocked paths from the previous organizer. Okay, right, that is the slide bit of my talk. So what I'm gonna do now for the second half, because just looking at the time and going for 35 minutes now, is I'm basically gonna quickly create a map um, an open orienteering map map, but also I'm going to go into the OSM ID editor and add a feature which actually will be a permanent orienteering control. Now, the data I'm going to use for the latter is this screenshot of my phone. Um, I'm not, not sophisticated enough um, to uh, last week's presenter where he had um, uh, Android, uh, the phone is effectively running on, on, on his desktop. So I've just taken a screenshot of my phone. Um, so let's, let's go to create a map. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to change um, my uh, uh, screen so that you can see open entry map. Okay. Good. Right. So when you look at the UK version of open entry map, this is the screen that you see. I'm on a, I'm on a rather um, small laptop here, uh, but anyway, and um, this is this is the typical view you see. So you don't see any orienteering map, and that's deliberate. Um, so you won't you won't see the specially created orienteering map until you zoom in several levels. Um, you can see there's a bunch of defaults. Um, uh, it's by default we when when we click to create our map sheet, it will be one to ten thousand landscape A4. Right. So I'm going to zoom into an area of London that I know well, and uh, this is where I'm going to create my orienteering map. And uh, apologies to the club that own this area, which has a proper orienteering map on it, which many people in this uh, uh, webinar may have run on. Um, but it's also a map that's got some new con new permanent orienteering course posts that I need to add. Um, if we're being more interactive in a seminar, I might I might um, say to people, do you recognize where this is? Um, but I can tell you the answer where this is, and you can see it's full of construction sites. This is the Olympic Park in East London. The reason why I've selected this area is because um, there is a new permanent or an updated permanent ensuring course going in. And I was out yesterday evening and basically found um, uh, uh, some extra permanent ensuring course markets. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a map covering Hackneywick, which is on the left, uh, and uh, the Olympic Park. So you click. And what that does is that adds a sheet. You can see the sheet here if I zoom out. And that is my mapped area. I'm actually just going to reduce it in size. I'm going to create a one to seven and a half thousand map uh, so that you can see the detail in this webinar because I know the resolution may be a little low. Uh, and uh, incidentally, if you were unable to read some of the text on the slides earlier, um, then I will distribute um, the, the slide deck that I showed so that you'll be able to see them in full resolution. Okay, so we've created our entering map. Now, uh, I'm going to be lazy. Um, I don't immediately know what where I want to cite my controls because maybe I'm new to the area. So I'm instead going to see if there's any post boxes. So you do this simply by clicking add post boxes. That goes off to Tracker's project and it pulls back six post boxes. And you can see them here on the right. Now you can see it says post box E3 followed by a code number. Now, if this was for a, a proper 
um, uh, evening street hour event, you would basically edit this uh, and delete these, and the organizer would, would note them down elsewhere. And then you can basically use uh, this function in order to, uh, people basically need to find the code and write it down as a thing. So you don't get to see it from here. Now I'm just looking at this map and actually all six of these look quite good. However, four and five is quite close. So I don't think we need to have four and five. So I'm gonna delete four. So that's this um, button on the right and that will delete that control. And then I'm just gonna finish um, deleting the codes. If you want to, you can change the position of the number relative to the control because you don't necessarily want your control number over obscuring an important uh, crossing point uh, or, or other things like that. Okay. Now I'm also going to add in, going to pull in some data from the Blue Flax project. Oh, there we go. We've got a couple of extra circles that have just come in here. And uh, we've got three plaques Stratford, De Stratford Depot, first plastic in the world was, was created here. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to delete the person's name. And if this is a proper race, we'd want people to basically write in the name of the person to prove they'd been there. And similarly, here I'm going to delete a date. And then finally, this one we'll keep as well. And we'll say what, who is a memorial to? So we'll delete that person's name. The text you see here is should be exactly the same text that appears on the plaque itself. You can also, if this is a score event, you can change the uh, number of points. So it could be worth 30 points or or um, 50 points or whatever score you like. Again, this is very much set up how we run the Stritos in slow, where we always score from 10 to 50 points. Now I'm gonna add a couple of other features. Um, I really want to highlight the fact that you can cross this motorway here. So even though it is shown as a bridge, um, it's quite hard to see on the map. So I'm gonna add a crossing point. I'm gonna set the angle to be about 70 degree, five degrees or so, because that is corresponds to the, the actual angle of the bridge. And you, you have to do that just by squinting it and approximating. There we go. Um, but actually, I don't like that. So I'm going to delete, press the delete button to delete all the crossing points and, and bridges and add it again. Let's try and get the angle a bit better. Uh, crossing point, which is the angle, let's maybe, let's try 60 instead. Okay. Uh, but also, I know for a fact that um, some of these roads are blocked due to construction. Uh, so let's add in uh, a cross here to indicate that this road is blocked by construction work. So you can see the cross is going in there. I'm just going to add it in as another one there. Okay. And then finally, um, we want some controls over here. But there's only two controls over here. So let's add a one in manually. And as I say, most people will probably manually add in all of their controls. I'm just being, uh, just making a very quick race this evening. So let's make this number uh, 11. And make, actually make a number 51, so our convention, and make score at 50 points. And we'll say, what is the name, the name of this bridge? Okay, so that is my uh, orienteering course created. I can change it name to Hackney Wick and Olympic Park. Um, race instructions, I'll just leave as, as default. I could say, you know, call this number if you're lost. Um, this is a, a thing that a lot of people do. Um, hey, I'm so sorry so to interrupt you, but I was just wondering, sure. can you move, um, Sarah has asked if you can move controls once you've put them in. Yes. Uh, uh, no, you can't move controls. What you can do is you can delete and then add another control with the same number back in. Uh, yeah, I, I, yes, I, I realise it would be nicer if you could just drag controls if they're not in exactly the right place. But the hope is that it's so quick to add controls in that you can just delete and then quite quickly just click to add, add a new one back in. Uh, but yes, it's a good question. And it has functionality that people have asked for um, uh, from time to time. And it's, yes, it, for sure, it is on the list of, of uh, nice to haves uh, uh, for this. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create my map. So you just hit save and get PDF map. And let's do that. Okay, uh, the map gets printed with a unique number. 
and you can punch that number into this box at the top and that will allow you to um, uh, reload the map in the future should you want to and then I'm just going to open my map now this will probably not view on the webinar but let's have, let's have a look oh and it is I think it's working give it a moment there we right, go and while it's while it's loading Ollie, another a few hot sure. questions on it um same question about start and finish and it from Catherine can you move start and finish points once you've imported it and uh, no no but again it's uh, and actually it's a good question because I first forgot to add a start and finish to this race um but uh you can just delete them with one click and then uh, you can add a new one in. Actually, you know, the way I think it works with start and finishes is if you add another start and finish in, it will delete the first one. So you can basically just click on the map. Uh, when you click on the map, I'm just going to go back to this tab. Will it go back? Yes, it will. Uh, when you go back to this tab, sorry, go back, so when you go to here, say we wanted the start and finish to be here. So it's that start and finish there. But then you decide actually, I think I want the start and finish to be here instead. Um, you simply click in again, and it's basically moved to down there. Uh, so okay, yes, that's a, that's what about said. what about moving the blue dot that's in the middle? Can you change yes. where the central is? Yeah, you can exactly. So that's the one thing you can move. So the blue dot is affecting as an anchor for your sheet of paper. So um, depending on your browser, you may need to click the blue dot first of all, so that it goes. A different shade of blue but you then you can basically drag the blue dot and that will move your map now of course the problem there is some of your controls if you already added controls will then no longer be in the map sheet and so you you maybe want to do the positioning of a map before you start putting controls down but yes um because the reason for this is you know it, it, it takes it's easy to delete or move one control just by deleting or adding back in but if you've laboriously added 30 or 40 controls and then you sort of realize actually you really want to show a path that is just off the northern edge of a map because it'd be really useful for people to get around then um, this ability allows you to slightly shift a map while keeping your uh, keeping your controls intact and you can show more or less of the map by changing the scale is that right so you can uh, show exactly more. yes yeah. exactly so say we decide actually one to seven and a half thousand is really not big enough for a street show taking an hour which is indeed the case and certainly for the, the speed of, of your interiors in London mm -hmm. so yes you can go to 10,000 which is a default or larger I'm just choosing quite a um, large scale here um, for resolution purposes mm -hmm. but yeah that's that's definitely possible to do and um, um, Joseph, asked, and Joseph I think he's been in all the seminars Root Gadget Map Run so um, thanks for attending all of these but he's asked about um, the colors on the map and obviously um, there are different views that you can use, can't you, to yes. as you're looking? That's a good point. And sorry, I haven't um, I haven't shown that yet. But yes, yeah, so here on the top left is the free styles. So the default style is Streeto, which is this very minimalistic um, style. But if I click pseudo, then you'll see that it it, it replaces it with um, the colours that we might be more familiar with uh, for regular orienting maps. So I'm just going to produce a map from the pseudo style. So let's just do that now. I'll give you a different code. Every time you hit save, uh, the map ID will change, by the way. Um, so let's open this new one. And there you go. You've got the you got the uh, perhaps more familiar um, colors of a regular orange map, though. But of course, it's a sort of it's sort of half it's sort of halfway between a street map and a proper map, but very much in terms of of, of the precision, it's, it's still just a street map. Uh, and then once you've once you hit save and get PDF map, these buttons on the top right um, become active, and this allows you to download a JPEG and JDW if you're importing to Root Gadget 2. You can it will open up a window of your clue sheet if you want to just print your clue sheet, um, or you can create your own. But you can also uh, download KMZs uh, and KMLs. I'm just downloading my KMZ and my KML now, uh, and that will allow you to import into Map from left. Now I'm not. This evening, going to actually load up Map on F and import it in, or to import it into the Czech sites um, from Map on F, because that was covered in last week's uh, webinar. Um, but that's these. This is the function which allows you to do that, and these files should work just fine in Map on F. And I, I could, I could load up um, Google Earth just to show, but for purposes of time, I won't, I won't do that. But essentially, you'd be able to see a sheet showing this map in Google Earth, which I think was also shown last week. Okay, so that was all I wanted to say about um, actually editing open or entering map itself. Just to say, if you if you decide you want to start again in terms of a sheet, you can delete the entire sheet and just and just put it down again. But that will start start the whole process all over again. Okay, now 
so one one key thing is the editing of OpenStreetMap in order to be able to get the detail of this background mapping in, but also uh, allowing me once we've got enough permanent rendering course markers in to make it worthwhile to add a button up at the top here saying add permanent rendering course markers, and that will come straight from OpenStreetMap. But we need some markers in OpenStreetMap in order for that to happen. So I'm now going to switch to OpenStreetMap. I'm just checking. Yes, it is. It is following the tab I move around. So here's OpenStreetMap for the same area. And as you can see, there's London's Olympic Stadium there, or London Stadium as we call it these days. Now I know for a fact that there is a new, um, uh, and uh, sorry for stealing uh, Chick's thunder here, but I know they've put in a new permanent orienteering control right beside the Olympic bell. You may remember that's that second largest bell in the world, uh, or free, free hung bell in the world that was rung by uh, Bradley Wiggins at the um, opening of Olympic Games. But anyway, you can go and everybody can go and see it now. It's, it's just there. Um, you, you can, unless there's a, a game happening, of course, there's no West Ham games happening right now. Uh, anybody who's nearby can, can basically walk and see the Olympic bell. But anyway, if you do that, have a look at, um, at a, a uh, uh, nearby because there is an, an orienteering marker. Now where this marker is, um, is basically based on a walk that I did uh, yesterday. So I'm just going to log into uh, Open Orienteering Map, uh, Open Map rather. And as I say, there's this function which allows you to import GPX traces. And I'm basically just going to go to one that I created earlier and go back to the map. Okay, it started up there, but I basically went down here. So if I go, let's just do it again, GPS traces, see my traces, um, go to it and then edit. So take a few moments to load because now I'm going to load in the high resolution aerial imagery uh, and all the, the data uh, from OpenStreetMap. Let's give it a moment. Okay, I'm just going to go down to, unfortunately I have my GPS trace on when I was north of the park. I'm just going back down. To the Olympic Park, here we go. And you'll see that my start, the route starts to get a little bit more like an orienteering type trace and I've always all over the place. Because this is me going around trying to find these permanent orienteering markets. So I'm zooming right in and you can see this is aerial imagery from uh, uh, um, my, uh, Microsoft, but if you are editing an OpenStream app, you can change the background imagery. Uh, and this is the first time I've done this, but let's have a look. There are these premium layers, and I wonder if they will allow for an even more precise map. That looks pretty good, actually. You can see the bell that I was talking about, casting shadow there. And then there's also this premium Im imagery option. May not be available in all areas, um, but anyway, this yeah, it's, it's rather nice. This area is really world imagery, so let's use that. And you can see from my trace that I went to the bell and then I went along and then I noticed, oh, there's the control. And I don't think you can actually see the control itself, but you sort of almost can. But what you can see is on top is the existing OpenStreetMap data. And this is showing where the flower bed ends here. And I remember if you if we go back to um, the slide, um, if I go back to here, this moment, then that's sorry, I'll just go back. That's that, that. This is the same location. And what I've done is I rather than actually editing OpenStream up on my phone, I am a bit old fashioned, I, I just like to note details down and then edit them back at home. But I did note down the code number 664 R. Um, so I maybe just spoil what the answer is for that permanent orienteering course. Uh, but basically, I can now add that data into OpenStreetMap, and let's do that. So I'm going to go back to OpenStreetMap. I'm I'm happy from my memory that I'm adding this, but you can see there's a slight offset between where I'm standing and the actual edge of the border. But I'm happy that it was essentially about there. So I'm clicking on it, and that adds a new point. And then here's the thing for uh, adding uh, permanent rendering uh, course markers. You need to be set them to be a point, which is the default. Just waiting for the uh, website to run a bit slow. Okay, so explaining the point doesn't mean tags. So let's add some tags. Okay, so the five tags we need to have are sport is orienteering, 
and once you add more than one you'll get default suggesting what you added last time so this will get easier and easier um, if you're adding lots of parent orienteering cross markers supported orienteering um, orienteering is a marker uh, we are going to say it is a marker and a marker is a post now marker is a standard tag and so you can see that as soon as I added marker, my, my parent engineering course control has now got a little icon of something which vaguely looks like a post, which is useful. Mm. And then finally, I'm going to put in the reference, which was 64. I'm just going to check that's right. 64, yep. And again, this is optional, but it will, it, it will be very useful for importing this data into open or into a map in the future, is to add um, the answer in as well. Let's so check that's right. Yes, and then all you do is you hit tick and then add some more. But then when you come to do it, you just hit save. Um, Open Street Map always wants you to put a comment in. So let's comment saying adding a clock marker in the Olympic Park. You don't normally need to go into that level of detail, but why not? And then upload, uploading changes to Open Street Map. Thank you for improving the map around Stratford, England. Uh, now, if uh, these markers were rendered on the standard OpenStreetMap render, then within a few minutes you would see it appear. Now, they don't. Um, the way features tend to appear on the standard render if there's an awful lot of them and they're distinctive enough. Now, arguably, permanent rendering course markers are rather small and not that distinctive. Um, so it's unlikely that they're going to appear on the regular OpenStreetMap map. But crucially, what they will appear on if I build an importer in is here. So you'd be able to now you, you would now be able to press the button that I'm going to add. It would go and do a query using a service called Overpass API, uh, and it would pull in that information into the map, and then you'd be able to press save and get PDF map and such like. We've, okay. Uh, now, we just had an interesting question in Ollie from Paul um, about street lamp data. He said, is is there any possibility of importing? Um, data, for example, from local authority uh, websites. That's a that's a good good point. And with the with advisors about being careful if you're doing bulk importing, of course, there's an awful lot of street lamps. Um, so unless you're a pro user, do be very very careful of putting a bulk import. But manually importing street uh, uh, um, uh, street lamps for sure. Um, street lamps are one of those things where. They aren't generally mapped on OpenStreetMap in most areas because they're just a little bit too detailed. I mean, I, I spoke to the founder of OpenStreetMap many years ago and I said, you know, when's the map finished? And he said, the well, map's never going to be finished until every blade of grass, every blade of, blade of grass is mapped on OpenStreetMap. Um, I don't think that's ever going to happen, obviously. But street lamps are one of those details which are generally not in OpenStreetMap right now in most areas, but maybe should be. And for us, of course, yes, they are a ready source of codes. And actually, we do often use street lamps in in slow street hoes, you know, what's what's the number on this lamp? Two or five or whatever it is. Yeah, for sure. Um, again, what you do is you go to, I'm just going to change back to my uh, Google Chrome. You just go back to um, the OpenStreetMap wiki, let's find out. Wiki. Um, and then, yes, I could potentially add these in as points of interest into Open Orienteering Map. Um, so there will, be, there will be, street lamps will be defined and they may, here we go, highway equals street lamp. Let's see how many street lamps there are in OpenStreetMap in the world. Uh, there are, wow, okay, 1.4 million. So, right, okay, so there are a lot of street maps already in OpenStreetMap, but also, of course, there's an awful lot of street, map, uh, street lamps in the world. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, add add in add in street lamps, or as they call them here, or street lights, and add in the code, which is probably called ref. Uh, oh, Ollie, the, the questions the questions are coming in now. Um, thanks to Colin, he said we can even do fire hydrants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The old codes. The general convention is 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 look at the wiki on OpenStreetMap and try, or, or rather look at and or look at how they're done in, in maybe another area and try and follow convention because it would be easier for me to import in a sort of standard way that things are done. So the, the, if everybody uses ref for the fire hydrants and uh, for street lamp IDs, then that means that I will know that ref is where the code is to pull in. But of course, furniture and um markers, we 
everybody who's in this webinar, uh, plus other people in the UK, the UK has more than half the permanent engineering course markers currently on OpenStreetMap. Uh, so we we almost own the tags, as it were. So we, so we have some control over the tags can be used, which would be make it very easy for me to import it into Open Engineering Map. Street lamps are a bit different because there's millions of them, and I bet you fire hydrants are also defined somewhere on the OSM wiki. But yeah, the more the merrier. And yeah. if if people suggest features like street lamps, fire hydrants, I was thinking monuments, um, point features basically. In other words, point features are easy to to pull in as a, as a control um, because and otherwise you there, need. To... Is there an easy way, Ollie, for you to be able to view existing? Um... POCs, because you mentioned there were some POC markers already in. Um... Yes, absolutely, there are. Um, uh, and uh, yes, it's exactly here, actually. Funny enough, it's very convenient. Um, this, so this is my final slide. Um, uh, we've got a lot of useful links on it. Uh, but one of these links is a project called Tag Info, uh, and it's called Where POCs Are in OpenStreetMap Currently. Now, there is a reason. Now, people who are really into taxonomies and tagging and all that, and you know, maybe some people on this webinar are, will think that why am I tagging sport orienteering and orienteering equals marker and marker equals post? You could say that orienteering equals marker is redundant, and you could just have sport equals orienteering, which is saying what the post is used for, and uh, marker equals post to say it's a post. There's a real benefit of having a what's known as a key called orienteering, because that allows for some quite nice things in projects like tag info. So this is the tag info page for the key equals orienteering. And it's basically showing that right now, or in the last few minutes, there are 545 um, permanent orienteering markers, which is up from 480 yesterday, because I added in a couple and I think I know somebody else has as well. Um, we can basically see what markers are most commonly used with, uh, so the values which are most commonly used with this key. Pole was the one that was used before, but I think it should be marker and not pole because it, it, it may just be a it, it's just how it was set up i think but i'm basically gradually if it's hopefully not too controversial in the community gradually converting poles to markers then adding in uh, a, a corresponding key for for marker but basically orienting equals marker is the key one um, these are the combinations so you can see what keys are used with those keys. So you can see that most, 90, 93% of orienteering equals X have ref equals something. Uh, and if this percentage is very high, then it makes sense for me to pull that tag in and do something useful with it in open orienteering map. So you can see that ref, sport, answer, and marker are the most common ones. And these are the four other keys I want people to use. Here's a map, but if you want to go into a detailed map, then you basically do this thing here called overpass turbo. This is the mechanism that I'm going to use to pull the data into Open Orienteering Map, but also the website will basically run live queries. It's running on a live database right now as, as I speak. Sorry, we can't realize. be any, we can only yeah, see yeah, your yeah. Um, question and answer. I know, no, sorry, I just, realized, just realized that very second. <laughs> right, right, don't, don't look at, uh, let's go back right now. Don't look at that. <laughs> sorry, so this is, this is the, uh, this is the tag info page here. When you click on that link, this is what you see. Um, so there's 545 permanent orienteering course notes. Um, these are the values and say marker is used by nearly 50% and I'm basically going to hopefully change that to about 100% quite soon because I think poll is, is incorrect to describe all orienteering posts as polls. Um, these are the combinations of other keys used with uh, those ones and you can see the top four are the four that I'm recommending that people use for this project. Uh, and then similar, don't need to worry about that, map shows a distribution you can see that essentially this is a western european project currently uh it's mainly uk there's a few in denmark there's a few in germany there's one in new zealand um, but anyway more useful than that is this link here on the top right called overpass turbo if i click on that it'll run this live this is what i was just doing now but really, as you can see um, this is doing a live query on OpenStreetMap, and it's highlighting all the current locations of um actually you know, digital was quite exciting can prove this is live because if I go to Queen Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, hopefully I should see, there it is, that's the one I just added um, with the five tags in there. Uh, and you can see, this basically hopefully allow people to see whether their local permanent training course has, has been tagged on OpenStream map. In most cases, no. As I say, there's only, I reckon, about 20 or so courses around the world, maybe 30 now which have got uh, the data in OpenStreetMap, and we know that there's more permanent engineering courses in just the UK. Would we, um, Ollie, when we were um, putting the um, POC markers out, 
would you yep. not put um would you put what club the permanent orienteering course belongs to for example that's, in the, a, when you that's a good that's a good point and I've, I've slightly skipped over the whole whole issue of the fact that um club members or, or um uh, professional mappers have spent time and effort and money uh, creating these courses and you know it's probably best if we use the proper orienteering maps that they've produced for these um it's very much the start of this initiative because i thought the course behind me was almost abandoned it's it's not but the maps are not available for public sale um, but of course it's a public park so it, it, it seems a shame if the public can't get hold of a map um, but yes in in case of many permanent orienteering courses there will be an existing club responsible for it open orienteering map is in no way replacing the proper orienteering maps for these and yes people can add tags to indicate not only the club or person even but actually maybe club who has who's who has put it down but also add a url with a website linking to the club page or the british orienteering page where people can download the proper maps remember yeah. purpose, purpose of it is not just to provide more data for me for my open orienteering map project but it's to map what's on the ground um, things that orienteers in particular care about and then we can get all sorts of interesting uses such as linking people to where they can download the map and you, know, you can create a tool you could can, can potentially because i know british orienteering has got a map of permanent orienteering course websites uh, permanent orienteering courses potentially a future map could be created from this data or new maps could be discovered using this data who knows but the main uh, thing is we get, uh, yeah. we get the data in I don't want to, um, obviously we've run over, but I just wanted to ask a couple more questions just on the practical sure. um, map. So for example, when you have the screen up, the map within landscape, um, is there a way yes. of turning a portrait? Yeah, absolutely. There's a button on the top left uh, and you can click and it will show it as a portrait. Brilliant. And then there's a couple of queries that have come in regarding out of bounds areas. Is there a way of marking out of bounds areas, um, for example, private, no public access, school premises, that kind of thing? That's a good question. I, I assume that all roads are public, uh, and road, roads and paths are public, and everything that's not is not a road path or park is not public. Um, and therefore, on the outer, on the pseudo map, I colour it in olive green, and in the street map, I colour it as white. And white is implicitly also do not access. Um, construction sites are specially out of bounds, if you like, and those are ma mapped with the temporary you know the magenta screen on our interior maps um, but it is very much up to the person creating a course to use do not cross markers and or steer the user away the mapper away from so the, the runner away from areas which um, they don't want them to go into um, rather than having a more formal way of showing that on the map um, there's a couple more questions that are a bit more technical so what I'll do for those that have sent those in is I'll share those with Ollie afterwards and we'll get back to you on a more private basis and unless there's anything else you want to add Ollie um is there anything else you want to finish on or um no just to say I've got a, a bunch of useful links here obviously there's the website itself for those more programmatically minded uh, then um, contributions to the github project are always welcome um, I do have a blog where I basically occasionally blog about updates to open orienteering map um, and if you're more interested in the open street map I know I, I emphasize open street map quite a lot in this presentation but that's because it is the key data source for this project then hopefully these links that I've got below there will be of help for that um, but yeah okay. apart from that so I think that's everything it's been really that's been really interesting and really useful Ollie so thank you very much for your time on that just for everyone um who's um the nice people that are still here um in about an hour's time the presentation will automatically be um sent to you which you can really look and, and have a look we'll also follow up by sending around Ollie's um presentation slides including all the links and for those outstanding question and answers um we'll get those back to you on a one-to-one -one basis but thanks everyone for engaging in this webinar um, really enjoyed it tonight so thanks Ollie um, hopefully we'll have a few more useful ones in the upcoming weeks but I want to wish everyone luck for organizing their uh, various virtual orienteering um, courses and activities whilst we're in this stage of lockdown so thanks all and we'll see you again soon thank you all for listening yeah.